Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Yeah, can you prepare more chairs because there are more people? <laughs> Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you here in our library at the Institute for Human Sciences. My name is Ivan, but not Krastev. Uh, it's Ivan Vevoda. Uh, Ivan Krastev, our dear friend and colleague, sends his apologies. He unfortunately couldn't make it to chair, so I hope, Randall, you're okay with me uh, chairing and, and moderating this session. I'm a permanent fellow and I head the Europe's Futures program here at uh, the Institute. It gives me great honor and pleasure to host this evening and moderate the discussion with Professor Randall Hansen, who is a professor of political science at the Monk School uh, of the University of Toronto. He is director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the Monk School and also holds the Canada Research Chair on Global Migration. His research focuses on forced and voluntary migration, citizenship, population policy, as well as on the effects of war and civil society. Randall is widely published. He has published several uh, books that have been great successes. Uh, he has focused on World War II as well. His book, Fire and Fury, The Allied Bombing of Germany and Japan, was a great success. He has worked on issues of eugenics, sterilized by the state, eugenics, race, and population scare in the 20th century North America. Um, Randall is here with us for uh, three months, and I love the topic uh, that he proposed for his fellowship here, called Dreaming of Europe. Refugees and the Old Continent, where he focuses on five cities in Europe, Rome, Vienna, Paris, Berlin, and London. Clearly, Europe, with all of its difficulties and challenges, is still the preferred venue for all, most of the refugees in the world. Nobody is really flocking to Moscow or to St. Petersburg or to Beijing for some strange reason, but maybe we'll discuss that as well. And so this evening's topic is War, Work and Want, how OPEC, OPEC, caused mass migration and revolution. Uh, we are also virtually pleasant, present globally uh, through the internet and the cameras and the microphone, so uh, we have a much broader audience. I'm very happy to see a full house this evening, and uh, I look forward to the lecture by Randall and also the discussion that we will have afterwards. So Randall, please take the floor. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, Ivan. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Um, apologies for the slight delay. The technology went wrong, but you know, it always does. But we got it there. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the kind introduction. I want to begin with a story about a Syrian boy named Shukri. His family was one of two million refugees who fled bombs gas attacks, and street fighting in Syria. And in January of 2016, he was 12 years old and working in a basement in suburban Istanbul. Scissors clenched in his teeth, he ran bundles of fabric between the shop's sewing machines, and he packed jumpers, sweaters, in boxes. He toiled 60 hours a week for 600 lira, well below the low Turkish minimum wage. There was no time for school. I can't go back to school, he said, because of work, but I will when my family returns to Syria. He would do neither. The sweaters that Shukri boxed up were made for the Italian fashion firm uh, Piazza Italia, which has shops and online outlets across Europe. There you can buy a men's sweater for 16 or 20 euro at regular price, but they're always on sale and you get them for around 5 euro. Shukri was one of thousands of Syrian refugees who work in the, Turk, uh, the Turkish textile and garment industry, and their clothes are sold all across Europe. H&M, Marks & Spencer, Esprit, 
Primark, and so on. The prices are at least 60% cheaper in real terms than they were in the 1970s. In that decade, factories in northern Italy and towns such as Prato produced them. The workers were Italian, the wages, if not high, were decent, and the sector employed many more people in Italy than it did Fra in France, Germany, and the UK. But in all of these countries, jobs had expanded in the sector. Then it all began to unwind. The Italian apparel sector has shed around 240,000 jobs, half the jobs in the industry. Those that remain, about 180,000, uh, have been taken up almost exclusively by mostly undocumented migrants. The pay is low, the conditions are terrible, and the market is shot through with human trafficking. All of these developments, mass refugee flows, child labor, migrants working in appalling conditions to produce cheap clothes, they're all connected. And in even more than that, they all flow from the same event. It happened in 1973. Now, having nor narrowed this story down to one person, one little boy, let me broaden it out to 281 million. For that is the total figure for global migration, 2020 figures. Global migration is at a historic high. It is, uh, in absolute terms, tripled since 1970. And in real terms, it's gone up by 1.5% of world population. That translates into a figure of 116 million additional migrants since 1970. This has happened, but it should not have. By 1970, and above all by 1973, there was every reason to believe that global migration would fall, or at least stagnate, that it was history, not politics, the past, not the future. First, one country after another in Europe ended guest worker and colonial migration schemes. Second, uh, the Americans controlled, for the first time ever, Mexican immigration. Third, America again, had restricted uh, Jewish, South European, and Asian immigration from the 1920s, and no one thought that 1965 legislation would launch a new wave. And finally, the economy went into freefall. Economic growth halved, it's never recovered, the 30 glorious years were over forever, and less economic growth should mean less demand for labor. And yet, it has gone up year after year after year. What's more, the public <coughs> opposed and opposes immigration. In no country except Canada, which is frankly a statistical outlier that gets way too much attention in migration studies, in no country other than Canada does a majority of citizens support immigration. And since uh, Jean Raspail's The Camp of Saints, there's been a steady stream of right-wing drivel telling anti-immigration North Americans and above all Europeans what they want to hear. And yet, as I said, immigration has increased year on year. So this is the question motivating the book, and it's a simple one. Why? And the answer is OPEC. On October 17th, 1973, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and the Organization of Arab Petroleum, Exporti uh, Petroleum Exporting Countries announced an oil embargo, which lasted about six months, and a permanent, or at least decade-long, price reevaluation. Oil prices quadrupled within a year. The oil embargo, as I said, was temporary. The price reevaluation lasted a decade, and the two together changed the global economy forever. Now, this is a story that has several parts. In the Western part, OPEC halved 
economic growth, and as I said, it never recovered. Almost overnight, pretty much overnight, we went from a world in which we had 5% growth per year, underpinning full employment, rising wages, and universal welfare systems, to one, at best, of 2.5%. And since 1972, when the uh, ma adult male uh, wage peaked, in 1972, wages, bottom line there, have stagnated ever since. They have stagnated for five decades. Uh, there is a Middle Eastern part to this story. Oil-driven inflation in the oil-poor Middle Eastern states, Egypt and Syria, uh, destroyed import uh, substitution industrialization, getting rich behind a tariff wall, and put, in the case of Egypt, the last nail in the coffin of secular, socialist, pan-Arab nationalism or Nasserism. And there is a Gulf state component to this story. OPEC flooded, as we know, the Gulf states with money in the greatest get-rich-quick or get-richer-quicker scheme in human history. So these are the three parts I'll take you through. And then, in the West, we turned on the workers. Politicians, academics, and journalists defined inflation as a wage problem. It wasn't the Vietnam War. It was outrageous demands on the part of workers. The workers, writes labor historian Jeffrey, uh, Jefferson Cowie, had to take their medicine. They would brutally and to a degree that no one uh, expected. It began under a Democratic president, tentatively, Jimmy Carter, who deregulated important sectors of the US economy, who refused to sign a uh, piece of labor legislation, and one could hear in that refusal, writes another labor historian, the death rattle of American working class power. But if Cardo, Carter did so reluctantly, President Reagan followed with glee. One of his first and defining acts was the firing of over 11,000 air traffic controllers, public sector workers. He tossed them all out, he utterly broke their union, their leaders were handcuffed and jailed, and they were banned from future federal appointment. This was PATCO in 1981. Alan Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, a prophet of financial deregulation, who would later express in tones of injured innocence, mystification, when the entire financial edifice that he helped construct collapsed in 2008, he hailed the move. It was, it was, he argued, Reagan's most important domestic initiative, one that encouraged private sector employees to exercise in full their right to fire workers. And that they did. Whatever the merits of the 1980 strike, the federal government's assault, very public assault on such a powerful union, emboldened private sector, con private sector companies. After PATCO, Labor historian Joseph A. McCartan observes, a credible threat to strike, the most potent weapon a union could deploy, it was lost. And after that, unionization rates in the United States uh, utterly collapsed. They went from 35% in 1955 to 10.3% in 2019, and only 6% in uh, the private sector. Now, inflation eventually fell following the great surge in interest rates under Paul Fokker, 20% in the early 1980s. But as soon as that threat to workers, workers was over, they faced another one, corporate consolidation, mergers. The Reagan administration's and American courts' willful indifference to antitrust legislation resulted in the merger mania of the 1980s. The supermarket, fast food, and retail sectors consolidated around a few firms, McDonald's, Walmart, the major supermarkets, and that gave them enormous buying power. They are able 
to determine their prices they're willing to pay and in so doing to place massive downward pressure on wages. Walmart perfected this technique. The firm drove down prices and wages with, and I quote, missionary zeal emboldened by the belief that they were making once luxury products affordable to middle class Americans. That they were, but if prices were low, someone else paid a very different price. During the same period, leverage buyouts uh, became a mania throughout the 1980s, and they, furthered, they further alienated company owners from the products and from the workers make, making them. Companies became commodities to be bought, sliced up, asset stripped, and sold as quickly as possible to the highest bidder. And the fate of the American worker was the last thing on the minds of many CEOs, in se except in so far as they sought to drive wages down to the lowest point possible. And finally, law firms and that other product of the 1980s, management consultants, got into the racket. Until the 1980s, most labor lawyers were labor by name and labor by nature. They were pro-union advocates who gave unions the edge. As late as the 1970s, anti-union lawyers and consultants were just a notch above ambulance chasers and bails, uh, bail bondsmen in the professional hierarchy. Today, legitimized by four decades of peons to unbridled capitalism, every major city has a coterie of law firms and management consultants that are there to bust unions and to prevent them from forming. And when a company gets wind that an organization effort is underway. It hires one of these firms, pays them millions of dollars to keep the unions out, and those firms always, almost always win. Okay, well that's the nasty neoliberal Americans. This is Europe. Well, in Europe, <coughs> uh, Britain accepted, the UK accepted, the assault on the unions was indeed far less direct, and generally, the CDU and the FDP in Germany are an exception, generally without the anti-union demonization. However, unionization rates nonetheless fell quite severely in most of Europe, except for the northern countries, and an EU posting directive in the mid-1990s, the high point of globalization, allowed firms to go around the unions and hire cheap, ex expendable labor taking uh, European citizens from one part of the union to another, from a cheap, poor part to an expensive part, and paying them uh, wages and social security benefits in the country that uh, they came from. There were, in this sector, uh, in the construction sector alone, 800,000 uh, posted workers. At the same time, EU firms, just like American firms, uh, outsourced and automated. So if you take the train ride, as I recently did, from the center of affluent man to the airport, you go through a landscape of abandoned factories uh, that gives you the sense that you're not in affluent northern Europe, but rather in the American Midwest. Um, those firms that could not be outsourced, which were labor intensive and which had to stay in Europe, textiles, agriculture, meat packing, retail, in those sectors, wages were in Europe driven down as they were in America, and the result was a collapse of working class wages. Now, these developments were not without their benefits. Lower wages create direct benefits for those workers, skilled ones, who retain or increase their earnings. Lower wages mean Low, uh, lower wages mean cheaper products. This is intuitively, intuitively obvious, but I'll give you two quick examples. After the collapse of a garment factory in Bangladesh, CNN compared the price, uh, uh, the cost components of making a t-shirt in Bangladesh versus making a t-shirt in America. Everything was cheaper in Bangladesh, not surprisingly, but labor was by far the greatest savings. It cost 22 cents in labor, to make a t-shirt in Bangladesh. That labor cost in America is 
and 50 cents. So what that means is a t-shirt made in Bangladesh on sale in America for $5 would cost $12 if it were made in America. Do the math quickly, something like 100 and a bit percent more expensive. That's the low end at the iPhone, the iPhone many of which uh, many of you have one in, the, in your pocket. That is made in China. The labor bill in China is $75. Not much compared to the overall cost, $1,000. If you made that iPhone in Seattle, the labor cost would be $284 more expensive, raising the cost of an iPhone by almost 30%. So at the low and the high ends of the consumer market, low wages increase consumer affluence. And again, they do this for the obvious reason that they lower prices. Now, what I do in this chart here is look at that across the entire economy. And what I'm trying to, comp what I do here is comp break down sectoral inflation and compare the costs of goods across time. And so what we have here is the cost in 1979, after the 19, nasty 1970s inflation. We have what the price should be if the price just followed inflation up in that particular sector. I mean, certain things went up more than others, of course. And what they actually cost. Food, until 2022, basically stagnant. But look at, look at jeans. They cost, in real terms, a third of what they did in 1979. Uh, men's sweaters, $100 down to $40. Uh, a woman's dress was $70 down to $23. Let's jump down to something else. A football was $52, now costs $14. A bike, I love them, $300. They now cost $84. A sofa, $1,200 down to 500. You see the point. The real price of a wide variety of goods has fallen and indeed almost collapsed. And this in turn explains a paradox that encouraged me to write this book. We hear again and again, indeed ad nauseum, that middle-class wages have stagnated since the 1970s, and they have. This is true, but our standards of living are much higher than they were in the 1980s. Anyone who remembers the 1980s, I do, can attest to that. And they're partly higher because of, of course, massive technological advances, but they're also higher because working-class wages have collapsed. And if we look here, what you'll see is that if you, this is good for all the students in the room, if you had a bachelor degree or, or higher, uh, your hour wages have basically stagnated. They've been constant. But as you go down the educational hierarchy, they fall further. Some college, they fell from $50,000 to 37. These are inflation controlled, of course. High school, 48 to 32. If you have less than a high school education, you were earning $40,000 here versus 57 between the bottom and the top. Your wages have just collapsed, almost halved in those years. That was 2008, just before the crash. It has not gotten any better since. Now, Unremarkably, working class um, wages have followed these conditions downward. As wages and conditions deteriorate, they reached a level where most uh, native born Europeans and Americans uh, were no longer prepared to accept. And so domestic workers exited the wage depressed sectors. These are again sectors that could not be outsourced for better positions by skilling up or for long term uh, reliance on unemployment support, and all too often, alcohol, substance abuse, and indeed, suicide. 
the depths of despair. As that process occurred, companies turned to low-skilled immigrants, documented and undocumented, to fill the gap. And so the, the need for a reservoir of cheap, disposable labor accounts for the overrepresentation of migrants in six sectors, meatpacking, agricultural, construction, uh, retail textiles, and domestic labor, labor, caregivers, cleaners. In every sector except the domestic, companies decimated, at times with the state's help, or circumvented the unions that stood in the way of this low wage strategy. This photo in the middle is in a sense incongruous. It's my current project, Refugees in Europe. These are refugees who drowned in the Mediterranean, and some of them are economic migrants who are in the refugee queues because there are no other queues that they can enter. They're on their boats because there are no legal channels in Europe. And these people who are dying are being drawn to Europe to work in all of these se sectors because we are not prepared to do so. Now, in the Global South, the dynamic played out differently. That was the American-European story, but it was the same result. Wealth came later, and there was no moment of peak unionization. Rather, Taiwan, Malaysia, Korea, and above all, Thailand built dynamic export sectors on cheap labor, first rural to urban, but when that ran out, or if it never existed, think Hong Kong, Singapore, the process was telescoped and these countries turned to migrant labor. So in East Asia, in agriculture, in fishing, in construction, in low-end manufacturing, uh, in retail, these sectors are, as in the global north, uh, wholly dependent on cheap migrant labor. Uh, in the Middle East, the, um, the post-OPEC demand for labor was greater still. Locals had no desire to work in oil fields, and women were excluded from work. So in the case of the Saudis, and Kuwait, and Qatar, and the UAE, countries had nowhere to turn, and millions of low-skilled workers, first Arabs, uh, later South Asians, came after 1973 to work in the Gulf states. So in all these parts of the world, in America, in Europe, in East Asia, in South Asia, migrants suffer to varying degrees, low pay and terrible conditions. They appeal because they're cheap, because they do jobs that locals will not, and because they are disposable, bearing the brunt of unemployment in times of economic downturn during the 2008 construction, cross, uh, uh, construction crash, almost all those who lost their jobs in the US were uh, Latino migrants. These are, this is a veritable global uh, reserve of disposable labor. And the result, when you add all that up, is just under uh, 75 million labor migrants globally in those six sectors. When you include Russia, the figure becomes 95 million. And when you include internal migrants in India and China that perform the same function, though they don't cro cross borders, the figure is 500 million low, skilled, exploited migrants. So who is to blame? Well, in their rapacious search for profits, some of you right remember Greco, greed is good, multinational firms are undoubtedly a villain in the piece. In multiple sectors, they launched a war on the unions, drove down wages, eliminated benefits. But they did not pursue this strategy simply for the joy of the kill. Rather, they did it to avoid going out of business. Had they not, their buyers simply would have gone somewhere else. And their buyers are us. In all these sectors, firms are responding to consumers, 
Competition does drive down prices and wages, but consumer preference drives competition. In the end, it is the consumer's desire for ever cheaper holidays, for food, clothing, cheaper electronics, cleaners, and caregivers. A desire to pay less and less for more and more, and ideally nothing, that pushes companies to meet this demand. So that is the story of labor migration, the about 95 million of the 116 million that I'm talking about in, in the book, 94, 95 million, it's, and why it surged up from 1973. But OPEC also had profound implications uh, in the area of forced migration and for the Middle East, for Central Asia, and for Russia. After uh, OPEC, Iran became richer than never before, and the Shah used to this to fund a massive modernization program, which unquestionably raised the standard of living in the country, but released forces he struggled to control, and that led eventually to the 1979 revolution and Khomeini coming to power. The arrival of Khomeini led to the Iran-Iraq war and the fact of oil in the Middle East and Americans' dependent, uh, dependence on it. Well, actually, Iran-Iraq war led first to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and then the American coalition attack on Kuwait, the liberation of Kuwait and pushing of Iraq back to its borders. But the point I want to ha you to hang on to is because of oil, all of this led uh, to 7,300,000 refugees. The um, Iranian revolution had profound consequences for another oil-rich state, Russia. The revolution, a product of 1973, led to the second oil shock of 1979. Oil prices went through the roof again. And this led to two things uh, in uh, Russia. This sudden surge in oil prices created petromania in the Politburo, a delusional belief that there were no limits to politics, that all things were possible. That petromania, combined with a fear, because of the tottering regime in Kabul, that Moscow would lose access to Afghan gas, which it had been stealing, frankly, for decades, led the Soviet Union in 1979 to invade Afghanistan. Now, in invading Afghanistan, Moscow thought that it would achieve a quick victory and install a pliant regime that would guarantee Moscow access to Afghan resources. However, declaring jihad, Afghan resistors in the countryside fought back with a tenacity and a brutality that shocked Moscow. Doesn't that story sound a bit familiar? And the Red Army responded as the Red Army does by drenching the countryside in all manner of bombs and mines designed, among other purposes, to blow the limbs off children. The goal of that campaign was to drive the rural population of Afghanistan into the cities, which Moscow still controlled, or failing that, um, out of the country. And it did. Five million went mostly to, uh, to Iran and to Pakistan, more in Pakistan. Rotting in refugee camps in northern Pakistan, young Afghan men, boys really, who had lost everything, who knew nothing but war, and who were schooled in anti-Shiite and anti-Western hate and misogyny by barely literate mullahs, they became the Taliban and they launched uh, the 9-11 attacks on the United States. 
which brought the United States into Afghanistan and provided the excuse, not the reason, the excuse for the second attack on, the, for the second Gulf War, producing another two million refugees. Now I'm connecting the dots here, as you will see. I'd like to emphasize that there is no uh, direct line between the oil crisis of 1973 and the refugee movements of the 1980s and, and beyond. Rather, there's a crooked and a broken one, one, filled, uh, one with gaps that were filled by other factors and many twists and turns that might have led to different futures. These turns were not, however, taken and the, un the oil crisis unleashed processes that resulted in the flight or the expulsion of tens of millions of people. And in that respect, this is my last section, the final dot I wish to connect is between the oil crisis and the Arab Spring. All lines in my story are crooked. This one is particularly so. The oil cri crisis nonetheless played a role. Whereas the sudden surge in oil prices was a great boon for the Gulf states, it was the opposite for those with little or no oil. Yemen, Egypt, Syria. For oil-induced inflation put the last nail in the coffin of import substitution industrialization. When growth collapsed and inflation surged, both countries, Egypt in the 1970s, Syria in the 1980s, they both embraced liberal capitalism or neoliberalism. Privatization, reduced subsidies for bread and, and, and heating, more open trade, inward American investment. As ever, capitalism created showy flashes of wealth that you could see in the hotels on the Nile or the streets of, of, of Cairo and Damascus. Uh, however, it also generated mass inequality from which the Islamists profited. These are the bread riots in Egypt of 1977. And in Egypt's case, you had a very interesting interaction effect. Sadat's embrace of neoliberalism was underpinned by him with, a, with an instrumental, not to say cynical, embrace of political Islamism. This eventually cost him his life when the Islamists murdered him, but the damage was done. Political Islam in Egypt enjoyed a great boost at exactly the moment in the mid-1980s when hundreds of thousands of Egyptian workers who had received a midlife education in Wahhabi extremism when they were in Saudi Arabia returned to Egypt, entering with Islamist intellectuals an utterly dismal job market. And don't get me wrong, as ever, the vast majority of Islamist activity in Egypt focused on providing services to people that the neoliberal state failed to, could not or would not, but a minority expressed itself in violent <coughs> terrorism. In Syria, Sadat's embrace of neoliberalism resulted in the same combination of conspicuous wealth and expanding inequality. And the simmering discontent that equality and poverty, which skyrocketed in the 1980s, created this eventually burst out onto the streets in the Arab Spring. Now, we, particularly, I think, in America that can't see any mass protest, at least one with which they are sympathetic through anything other than the lens of the American Revolution, we think of this as a movement for freedom and democracy. It was, but it was also, and I would argue more fundamentally, a call for economic justice. Remember how the Arab Spring started. Mohammed Abu Azizi set himself on fire, and his cry was for economic not for political freedom. These were his last words. How do you expect me to earn a living? Now that's one data point, 
but Arab Barometer did a survey from 2012 to 2014, and it found that the drivers of the Arab Spring, what took people to the streets, were economics, corruption, and social injustice. The main drivers were corruption and betterment of the economic system, and social and economic, uh, sorry, corruption and betterment of the economic system were tied at about 65%, and social and economic justice at 57% people citing them as reasons for going out onto the street. Civil and political freedom, though important, were only 42%. And these feelings were particularly acute in Egypt and in Syria, the oil poor uh, Middle Eastern states. As we all know, uh, the result of the Arab Spring was a civil war in Syria that produced 7 million refugees and made Syria the largest refugee producing country in the world, knocking out the previous number one, which was Afghanistan, another product of oil driven refugees. So the oil crisis set in motion processes in Iran, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, and in, though I've not discussed the case, Libya, processes that generated over 20 million refugees. So, to sum all of that up, here's the 22 million uh, refugees, to sum all of that up, against both scholarly expectations and public wishes, uh, migration tripled since the 1970s because of the way in which the OPEC oil crisis reconfigured the global economy and geopolitics. War and work generated tens of millions of refugees, but so did want our desire for ever cheaper products and services. And I'd love to end this on an optimistic note, but I cannot, because there's little evidence that anything is going to change. The dependence of multiple sectors, of middle-class affluence, and of economies as diverse as those of Germany, of Thailand, of the United States, and Korea, on low-skilled migra migrant labor, all of that suggests that such immigration will continue. Mass migration is not, as Sir Paul Yeh claims, a temporary response to an ugly phase uh, in which prosperity has not yet been generalized. It is rather a structural feature of contemporary capitalism. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Randall. That was a terrific tour de force uh, on a huge subject that I think we've all been uh, witnesses, actors, as you say, as consumers, but also as uh, people who have looked at this in, in a variety of ways. Uh, I'm reminded um, about your, your T-shirt iPhone example um, that uh, President Obama asked Steve Jobs, can't we bring some of this back production uh, to the United States? And Steve Jobs' answer was exactly what you said. Well, we can, but it'll cost three times more. So the role of China is a question that, that begs to be answered. You know, how, how, how does that factor in into all of this? Just a few undisjointed uh, thoughts, obviously, Margaret Thatcher is a case in point with Reagan, the way that she destroyed the, the unions in the, and the coal mines. There's also the question of full-fledged U.S. support to the Taliban to help expel Russia. So a kind of a self-feeding yeah. uh, way in which the Taliban became uh, what they were. And then your last point, of course, reminds all of us who, who are pupils of Hannah Arendt and her study of the French and the American Revolution, the social question, or very simply put, bread, is the driver all of, all, of all of these uh, rebellions uh, or revolutions, uh, which couples obviously with the need for freedom. And I think your description of the Arab Spring is exactly correct. People, when they don't have food, they, you know, extremely 
like Mohammed, was easy, they burn themselves uh, or, or they go out and seek a change, change of regime. So, so the, the famous quote by Marie Antoinette about, you know, if, if you don't have bread, eat your brioche, uh, is, is still valid in, in many ways, quote unquote, cynically said. But my, my first question before we open it up for, for the floor would be the, how can I put it very simply, the relinquishing role of the state uh, after World War II that was you know, a welfare state, to speak simply, that kind of balanced out the need for uh, public interest investments in health, education, and the like. And then, as you demonstrate through uh, your lecture, and obviously the role that OPEC uh, played, but the fact that the state, in, a, in this neoliberal fashion, removed itself from its, may I say, obligations mm. to, f to feed on that. And obviously, many authors have, have looked on that. So l let me ask you that, that question, how you see the role of the state. Oh, yeah, very funda uh, fundamental. And I have to say, I agree. And I think I touch on a lot of the points that you made as well yeah. about, about China. The, the state was absolutely fundamental. Um, most definitively in the case of the United States. I mean, I'm trying to tell a global story here, uh, but the US uh, is the most important case because it's of its size in the global economy, 25% in the 1970s, um, because it went furthest, but also because it exported those neoliberal policies very validly to uh, the rest of the world. Um, the question is why? did the state play such a fundamental role? Uh, and what is that role? I mean, I discussed it briefly. It, it, was, it was threefold. It was um, a rhetorical attack on the unions. It was anti-union legislation. It was massive deregulation. And it was um, utter indifference to predatory capitalism in the form of ignoring antitrust legislation. Why? Well, I think what happened is in the 1970s, the right saw its moment. You had this unexpected, unanticipated, massive exogenous shock in, in the form of the oil crisis. Inflation went completely through the roof. Growth collapsed. It was a grim decade. And the right, which certainly since the 1950s, the Goldwater right of the Republican Party, arguably since the ne New Deal, had opposed the New Deal, had opposed the welfare state, had opposed great society, had, had opposed redistri redistribution. It saw its moments and was able to delegitimize de all of that by saying all of this, this economic chaos that you see, which was real enough, this is the fault of them. As you demonstrated very patently, the flow continues and rises. Is it easier for these countries and these governments to sort of turn a blind eye and fulfill those 400,000 jobs in an Italy or a Germany than to really roll up their sleeves and say, gosh, we need to organize this and, and have a more decent way in which people come and work here? Yeah, and speak truth to populism. Um, yeah, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, several things are going on. On the one hand, you will talk to German politicians who will say there's no... There's no low s demand for low-skilled labor in Germany. This is complete nonsense. Of course. 30 percent of 30 percent of German jobs are low-paid. Germany has a, a dependence on low-skilled labor that is only matched in Western Europe by neoliberal Britain, and only in Central Europe by by Poland. Um, so on the one hand, that's a bit of denial and delusion. On the other, they are absolutely tolerating these migrants. And the extreme case of that is Italy, where uh, it's incredibly easy to live. It's not fun, but it's relatively easy to live informally in Italy, and your chance of deportation are extremely low. If you're picked up generally for a minor offense and taken to a deportation center, you just have to hang out there for long enough, six weeks, I have to check my notes, and then you're released again back into the labor market. And people know this function is being fulfilled. The problem is they're not telling it to uh, European publics who believe the rhetoric that these are scroungers and um, welfare scroungers who are stealing our jobs, the usual 
contradictory attitudes towards immigrants. Um, not prepared to open the legal channels because of the political price and are making the problem worse because the moment you create the impression that you have no control of your borders, support for immigration collapses. I mean, I hate to bring Canada up because again, I think it gets too much attention, but what you will say about Canada is that it takes in 400,000 migrants a year with zero political backlash, partly because they're high skilled, but also because the borders are controlled. People will support a legal, regular process of immigration when they feel like it's lost and out of control, support collapses. But it's out of control because this structural need for immigrants is only being satisfied by the refugee queues. And that's the fault of the policymakers. Terrific. Well, we have uh, a very good half hour for questions and answers. Uh, I see Louisa here immediately. Could we have the microphone? Right here. And do introduce yourself, please. Thank you so much for this lecture that really gave us a very long and wide sweep of these developments. And I guess um, Ivan in part asked my question, but I wanted to follow up because you describe, I think, very nicely all these political economic shifts that have happened. But they were also accompanied, as you were hinting right now in your responses, by very specific political choices. And, you know, both in North America, but I mean, I can focus on Europe, thinking about the development of increasingly restrictive migration regimes that um, favored or made possible mobility for some based also on the immobilization of others. I mean, think of what happens with Schengen, right? I mean, and, you know, you mentioned agriculture, the sort of circular migration that was happening from places like Morocco to the fields of southern Spain suddenly becomes irregularized and that's what happens to a lot of these populations because i guess you know you raised one question during your talk saying you know how is it possible that you know migration keeps increasing and yes there's increasing kind of pushback and i think you were giving an answer to that so how do you combat these forms of irregularization that are also a result of political choices i mean they're not only the result of political economic developments um, and then, you know, a huge question, what happens with the end of oil? So, uh, migration and the Anthropocene. <laughs> uh, that's, that's probably for another talk, but thanks so much. Randall. Um, yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Louisa. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, so it's more of a question on um, how, one, how one combats this. Well, I mean, the far right has to be defeated before anything can be done, because... Um, as long as they're enjoying such widespread support, it's so utterly easy for them to make simplistic racist arguments that in certain contexts appeal. Okay, I'm not gonna say how you can possibly defeat the far right, that is not easy, <laughs> but it seems to me it involve two things. One is pointing out that they actually don't have any solutions to any of these problems, and actually ad addressing the component of not the far right argument, but how the far right of the kinds of um, processes you were talking about, or is this the beginning of a new cycle in which more stuff is going to go badly wrong? Uh, okay, Randall, if you can take those two. Yeah, fascinating. Um, very, very interesting questions. I'll, 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 I'll take the, the first question first. Um, well, yes. <laughs> Partly because as, as bad as these processes are, they're worse in the West. So if you think it's rough being, and it is, and I describe it as such, being a Latino migrant in um, the United States, try being, and I talk about that, a Burmese um, undocumented labor working on a fishing boat in Thailand, and this has been addressed because it became public, but just a few years ago, you were at sea for months on end, tied to a boat, beaten, whipped, forced to work 16 hours a day, and you're only out until you docked with suicide. I mean, you were, you were a slave. I mean, there's no question about that. And then two other things. Um, the mi migrants, certainly, to your point, migrants, they certainly think the West is worth saving. The <coughs> location that people most volunteer, people will go wherever there's work and wherever is close. But where most migrants want to go is to the West, to Western Europe, and to North America. And to me, you know, this is very personal, but when you ask me to judge a society, I just, I have three words in response. Um, women, 
Jews and gays. How are they treated? And where they're treated best, that is worth saving. And that is the West. To your, um, to your very interesting <laughs> questions. Um, Yeah, I do approach this in the book. And there was, <coughs> there was this moment in the midst of COVID, perhaps I was the interminable lockdowns in Toronto, the, the 29th ra wave and the 14th lockdown, perhaps I was just going a little bit mad. <laughs> but I began to get optimistic. And I thought, you know, we finally buried the ghost of inflation. Um, Biden's promising this massive in infusion of funds. We're seeing organization <coughs> records. We're clapping for workers and we're appreciating them. We see the importance of low-skilled immigration. Clapping for workers and we're appreciating them. We see the importance of low-skilled immigration. Well, my optimism has utterly collapsed. Um, and so what I say, I mean, the, on the good news, there's two good news stories. One is that inflation is lower uh, and we don't have the same extreme economic dislocations that we did in the, uh, in the 1970s. Um, we're actually seeing a certain degree of uh, reduced wage dispersion. So the fall, interestingly enough, because of the attendant labor shortage, the fall in wages, which is real, is greatest at the top. So we're actually, in this strange moment, getting a slight bit of increased equality. However, those wages at the bottom are being overwhelmed by inflation. And unlike the 1970s, which arrived after three decades of uninterrupted growth, this inflation arrived after five decades of stagnation, whereas wages beat inflation in the 1970s, they are trailing it today. So what I, what I say in the book is that all the processes that we see will continue and possibly intensify. So we are in an AGP Taylor moment. And we reached a turning point and we failed to turn. That's my view. Okay, there was a question there in the middle. Casper, if you could pass the microphone. Thank you. Sorry, my name is Jasper Gruhl. I'm a mathematician by trade. And I'm getting nervous. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, in UK and US, one of the culprits in my mind was Friedman and the way Reagan and Thatcher adopted that. And that really crushed the working classes. And I didn't hear you mention anything about that. So what's your opinion on this? I'm Sorry. No, please, no, please. No, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, go, go ahead. I, go ahead. Uh, did, did you have a question? Sorry. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, it w it's only a small uh, question. Um, you mentioned that the Taliban uh, um, conspired or made conspira uh, conspiration to against um, the World Trade Center. <laughs> um, how do you explain that? Uh, f I, I think it was like 17 people who uh, did these ac attacks. And two of them were not Saudis. The rest was uh, were, were young men from Saudi Arabia. N not a single one, n nothing, no, no relation to, <laughs> to Afghanistan. Sure, sure, no, I know what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so, th oh, sorry, you want to take, yeah. no, go, go ahead, take a third, go ahead. One go more ahead. here. I can keep three thoughts yeah. in my head. Okay, just. three. Yeah. Um, my name is Mirjana Tomic, Presser Group Concordia. I have one question. Uh, you implied that uh, capitalism was not so bad in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia and Nordic countries, and that only the far right is uh, not very friendly to immigrants. In Denmark, it is the Social Democrats uh, who have a wonderful uh, policy towards the majority of the population, but not towards... Uh, and now Sweden, after its gang wars, uh, is obliged to, in fact, most Swedish politicians say we wish we were Denmark and have this harsh cow. How do you explain that? Yeah, yeah, no, very, very good questions overall. Okay, 
Uh, yeah, so um, Milton, good old Milton. Um, yes, I mean, I do, I do, I talk a little bit less about Hayek and Friedman and um, the kind of intellectual history that, that lay behind, uh, that laid behind um, the triumph. I'm more, I was more interested in sort of the political coalitions and the political lobbying and the interaction effect between inflation um, the far right of the Republican Party, um, William F. Buckley Jr., the K2 Institute, these right-wing think tanks, many of whom emerged in 1973. Pay attention to that year. It comes back again and again and again. Um, so I don't mention Friedman directly, but I agree it, it was important. Uh, the only interesting thing about, about Friedman, for whom I don't have a huge amount of, of sympathy, is that he was one of the few people who did not blame the unions, even in the United Kingdom. You know, you're the mathematician, but he blamed this on a, on a, mon on a monetary problem. We had to restrict the monetary supply. So oddly enough, he was one of the few people that didn't define it as a wage problem and union problem, but their influence was massive. I think probably arguably more so in the United Kingdom, in the case of Hayek and Friedman, than in the United States. Yeah, yeah. It resulted in death of coal mining, schools, everything. Yeah, the British welfare state, Americans the trans. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and this was, and, th and this is the, th the importance of America I and also Britain is how this was exported. I mean, Germany, and again, seeing another moment, the German economy suffered a decade of stagnation because of bloody uni <laughs> um, unification. I mean, you attacked. It's like attacking th attaching three Mexicos circa 1988, not the Mexico of today, onto the United States and say, make them rich within a decade. I mean, Germany was on its knees and all, all these American economists and public intellectuals and the US government was saying, ah, this is your fault because you have an excessively generous welfare state. You need to adopt neoliberal policies. It was all complete nonsense. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. The, the Taliban weren't on the plane, but it's, it's, very, it's very simple. They... Um, they housed um, uh, bin Laden. I mean, they gave him shelter and he organized his plot and he worked very closely um, with uh, El Zahari and, and Al Qaeda. So, that, I mean, that is, the, that is the connection, yeah, with the Taliban. Um, you know, had, had the Taliban not entered into a partnership with, uh, Bin Laden, and they did in the 1990s, um, the attack on the United States would not have led to the American invasion of, of Afghanistan. Yeah, simple as that. Um, I've written down far right. The oh yeah, the Nordic. The, the, Nordic, the Nordic countries. Yes, the Nordic countries. Denmark. <laughs> no, the, the, the only thing I think they get better, you're, you're right, it's a classic kind of insider-outsider problem. Where the Nordic countries have done better is in um, the strength of, uh, of the unions, of high play for working class jobs, you know, $20 an hour at McDonald's, um, good benefits, uh, holidays, on the of issue of, of migration that they've not done better. And part of the next project, I want to think about the way in which <coughs> low skilled labor migration flows interact with different political economies in Europe. You know, the massive informal economy within Europe, neoliberal Britain, and then the Nordic, the Nordic welfare states. Where Nordics tell me there's no demand, again, the same rhetoric I hear on Germany, no demand for low-skilled labor, but I'm, I'm not far enough yet to comment, but I, I certainly take your point. Okay, next questions, comments. Okay, right at the back. Yes, can you please help pass the microphone? Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. I'm Volha Bizikova, postdoctoral fellow at Central European University. I wanted to ask you because uh, you you showed it very like extraordinary how the oil crisis played into it. But at the beginning, you also mentioned and then explained further during Q and A that it were actually political choices and that somehow it was a uh, right-wing coalition that use it as an opportunity. But I wanted to ask how it was so easy, how it became so plausible to assign inflation to the labor. Uh, 
And in fact, you then mentioned that right wing hardly have any solutions, but I wanted to ask whether the alternatives actually have any solutions or whether they were suppressed, this political alternative, because we can think also, also about uh, uh, Democrats in the US and uh, labor in, in Britain who were actually enforcing new liberal policies as Blair and Clinton. So we find that it's not only the domain of far right, but rather across the domain, this consolidation on politics. Thank you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so, so oh, sorry, you want to collect a couple of questions. I apologize. I'm just, I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Martin Wolf, I'm a citoyen. Um, question one, uh, the role of pension funds uh, has not been uh, yeah, expressed in any way. Actually, it is uh, rather our uh, the present age when I took a look around here, it's the benefits of the pension funds. And the biggest pension funds are actually from uh, the, those people who are in government type or, or protected uh, businesses like uh, Californian uh, law, um, uh, teachers pension fund and so on. And the second question is, uh, haven't the unions actually just failed to adapt their business model? And is thus not also a, a deep part of the problem? I remember being young and crisp right out of university, uh, although a few years ago, yes, but uh, <laughs> we had the problem that we had more or less an enforced membership into unions. You were demanded to join the union. This is a, a here in this country? In this country. Yeah, yeah, okay. Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to, to um, uh, the, fir the first question, um, just, uh, just to be clear, um, what I argue is that the flattening of economic growth was the, respo the, response, uh, the result of OPEC, that that destroyed growth overnight. And there are others who reject that argument that say, no, 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 it wasn't OPEC, it was Bretton Woods. I discuss that in the book and give the reasons why I think OPEC was more important than Bretton Woods, though Bretton Woods was relevant. Um, and then you're right, then there was the next step in which, uh, uh, speaking of the labor story, inflation was divided as a wage problem. It was simply intuitively very appealing and a very simple argument to make uh, because economics is fantastically complicated. And if you tell people these greedy unions who are out in the street and who are interrupting your, your drive to work because they're ordering a big demonstration, are at fault. Uh, that argument appeals, but it was turbocharged in the United States by racism. The Republicans' great success was in associating government spending, big government, with African American um, idleness and fecundity having 13 children and, and, and living on welfare. Now that chiefly delegitimizes programs like uh, aid to families with dependent children, and food stamps, even though the vast majority of people profiting from them were, were, were white, but it also became a general indictment of big government, of progressive policies, of strong, strong unions. Uh, but then to, I'll jump to the second point and then come back to pensions. The unions themselves behaved abysmally um, to varying degrees in various countries. Uh, so as, as poor, as difficult as the unions in Austria were, they behaved much better within the, dare I call it the German ac economic zone in Austria, or will I get into trouble? <laughs> but in Austria, in, in Switzerland, and in Germany, where you have co-determination and unions that see themselves as stakeholders in the economic process, the unions behaved much more reasonably. And to the alternatives question, the West Germany in the 1970s was an alternative, where you, where you dealt with inflation in a much more cooperative manner and where pain was redistributed, where a more long-term view of profit was taken. And West Germany came out of the 1970s actually actually fairly, uh, fairly well. Um, in the United States, above all, uh, the unions were run by corrupt leaders with uh, links to the mob. Uh, they were racist, they were homophobic, they were sexist, uh, 
they made zero effort to organize the chiefly female um, sectors that were enjoying rapidly expanding employment as women entered the labor en masse. So they do have something to uh, answer for. And in fairness, they were caught off guard because public sector union rates were rising so quickly in the United States that for several years they just looked at their dues and thought, hey, we're okay, we're, 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 we're okay here. Um, but as abysmally as they sometimes behaved, I don't think even better unions in the United States would have survived the corporate and, and governmental assault. A uh, question on, on pensions. As, I mean, there's two directions. I wasn't sure if you were telling a story about how um, you know, the, the, the old are, I'm trying to choose polite language, um, Senior. benefiting to the detriment of the young. Um, and that is certainly going on at the moment. But there's another way in which I do mention the pensions, and it's kind of a, a great irony, is that some of the peak union successes in the late 1960s and 1970s in the United States, where you don't have universal wealth care, is enforcing countries to develop more generous health and pension funds. Well, those unions and those companies poured that money en masse into the stock market, which is the only way you can make money, and they empowered the institutional investors that would eventually turn their guns on, on the workers' movement. So that, that's the pension connection I draw, but uh, you might have been thinking about something else. Questions, comments? Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, yes, round two for the two gentlemen there. <laughs> Unsatisfied, clearly. <laughs> no, 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 we need the mic because of our global audience. You're being recorded, yeah, yeah, it's also being broadcast. So uh, this is the question I actually wanted to ask earlier as well, the second bit. Because you say multinationals are the culprits, and at the same time, middle classes are de demonized as well because it's them demanding everything for virtually free is causing this propagation of working classes. I, I know I sound terrible, but is, is that an issue as well? Sorry. No, that's a good, great, great, yeah. great question. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, maybe I, I, didn't, I overheard it, but uh, I'm surprised that you didn't mention globalization um, and free trade. I remember a slogan from the American auto workers in the 1980s, where it said, hungry, question mark, eat your, tot eat your Toyota, <laughs> exclamation mark. So if you have free trade, you cannot have a textiles industry at high wages in, in the US. It's simply not possible. Okay. Randall. Yeah, yeah great. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised that no one reacted to that. That's usually, I've only given this talk a couple of times, people are usually deeply offended by the suggestion that they're in any way co-responsible. Uh, co <laughs> I mean, the causality is very hard to, to sort out here because all these things were hop happening at once. So I'm not making an, any effort to actually put percentages on this, above all with a mathematician in the room. Uh, but I don't think you can let the consumer off the hook. And there's this great uh, temptation uh, among many of my friends, most of whom are on the left, to blame this, this nasty structure called neoliberalism and not to think about their own choices and how that affects. So, you know, I had, had a good friend. He said, hey, this is this back in Toronto. We're going out for drinks. Oh, this is great. Look at this shirt I got. I, I paid $18 for it. Isn't it stylish? And I said, yeah, it's stylish. But do you think it, just think a little bit how, about how that that shirt was made. Um, I mean, I, I quote a, someone from Black and Black and um, not not Black and Decker. They cite Black and Decker, but it was a labor historian who said, you know, um, the North American, I see the European consumer thinks deindustrialization is terrible, and they think cheap products in shops are are brilliant, and they simply fail to connect the two. Where the story gets complicated is not with the middle class, which I think does have something to answer for here, but for the poor, because what you're getting is this vicious circle. If you, if you create a massive class of 
low-skilled, low-paid workers, it becomes self-reinforcing because that inevitably creates more uh, demand for, for cheap products because people making nothing can avoid nothing else. And that's where we get these very ne negative lock-in uh, feedback effects. So I don't certainly don't hold those consumers responsible, but I do, I do hold the middle classes responsible. So that, that would be my answer uh, to that question. Uh, free trade. Okay, now I'm, gonna, uh, now I'm going to tack in a different direction. Uh, what we also have to recognize in this story is that um, extremely poor parts of the country have gotten wealthier. And real wealth has also been created in Asia and a middle class that didn't exist in Korea, in Taiwan, um, in Hong Kong, Thailand's more middle income than rich, that didn't exist in, in India now does exist. And this is a good thing. To my mind, it's not free trade. I think free trade actually is a good. It's how you negotiate, and Stiglitz makes this point as well. It's how you negotiate the free trade agreements. And the problem with the United States above all is that they were organized uh, with utter indifference to the American worker. And uh, I, the IMF, I think it was, I cite the report, did a study of the relationship between free trade agreements and the loss of unionized jobs and it was far lower in countries with strong union movements like the Federal Republic of Germany than it was in the United States where, sir, to your point, there's all, you know, not exactly a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's, but it's pretty tight. But, I, but the, just the kind of isolationist response that we should throw up uh, tariff walls and be indifferent to poverty in Taiwan or Korea to keep jobs in America. And there's an element of the of the union left movement that had a xenophobic, anti-Japanese, particularly in the 80s, anti-Asian element to it. We have to be a little bit, I think, careful of that. Okay, I'll take the prerogative of the chair for the final question. Uh, Dreaming Europe, and you have been now in Europe, and you've done a round of few of your cities. Yeah. What are your first conclusions? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, two. I'm not that, yeah, that, no, that's a very unfair question because I've not, I've not <laughs> finished the research on that one. Spontaneous. Um, uh, two. two. Um, one is the continuation of this story uh, that, um, say, asylum seekers, some are convention refugees, some are forced migrants, and in another sense, some are actually moving to get a better job. Uh, all of them in Europe are satisfying a fundamental structural need for cheap labor that isn't being recognized. Conclusion one. Conclusion two, there is a dream of Europe. For all the problems, for all the racism, for all the restrictions, when I ask one refugee after another, why did you come to Europe? Some of it's about a job, of course, but mo mostly it's I'm safe, I can walk down, you know, there might be a stupid racist comment from now again, but I can walk down the street without fear of being beaten, without fear of ending up in a Libyan, a Libyan torture camp, and because there are as hope for our children. And so that's and an optimistic and side of the story. Please. Sorry? No, but that's not that's not the main reason. That's not the not the main reason that uh, twenty a twenty. That's not true. A twenty-two year old, a twenty-two year old um, Malian worker who's coming to Europe is not coming for the health service because they don't need the health service. He's coming here to to get a job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that somewhat optimistic note, yeah. thank you very much, Randall Hansen. That was terrific.